I am going to talk about the use of group theory in particle physics. Don't be intimidated by the name. Although it sounds unthinkably difficult, this topic is very understandable. First, I will explain the math of group theory. Next, I will explain the basics of modern particle physics. Finally, the exciting part, I will bridge these two subjects, illuminating the connection between mathematics and physics on a fundamental level. First, the math. To understand group theory, let's talk about symmetry. What comes to mind? You may think of a snowflake, a butterfly, or maybe the human body. In everyday language, symmetry means beautiful and harmonious, balance and proportion. In mathematics, symmetry has a more precise definition. It means that an object is invariant, or left unchanged, under a transformation, such as a rotation or flip. A familiar example is a rotational symmetry. It exists if you can rotate an object while it remains visually the same. Consider two simple shapes, the cube and the sphere. Which is more symmetric? In the case of the cube, there are 24 different ways to rotate it, such that it retains the same shape, so we can say that a cube has 24 symmetries. With a sphere, since there are an infinite number of symmetrical rotations, it has an infinite number of symmetries. Now it is obvious that since a sphere has an infinite number of symmetries, while a cube has only 24, the sphere is more symmetric than the cube. Let's move on to the concept of a group. A group is the set of all symmetries of an object. For example, the symmetry group of a cube consists of 24 elements, each of its 24 symmetries. A group is an abstract mathematical entity that describes an object and is constructed from an object's symmetries, not the physical object. Certain groups are given specific names. For example, the symmetry group of a sphere is known as SO3. Now it's time to talk about the basics of particle physics. Particle physics is the study of the fundamental constituents of our universe, the basic building blocks, and the interactions between them. You probably have learned that all matter consists of atoms, which in turn consist of electrons orbiting a nucleus of particles called protons and neutrons. What you may not have learned is that both protons and neutrons are made out of even smaller particles called quarks. There are six different types, or as physicists say, flavors of quarks. We will be dealing here with only the three most common ones, which are the up quark, the down quark, and the strange quark. Quarks only exist in what is called a bound state of two or three quarks known as a hadron. A proton is a hadron with two up quarks and one down quark, and a neutron is a hadron with one up quark and two down quarks. But what about that other strange quark? If protons and neutrons make up all matter, and they only consist of up and down quarks, then what are strange quarks for? It turns out that there are, that there are numerous other hadrons besides the familiar proton and neutron. If many other particles exist, why is our ordinary world made up of only protons and neutrons? This is because the other hadrons decay or break down very rapidly, so we can only observe them for a very short time. The proton and neutron are both far more stable than the other hadrons, and as a result, they form the stable matter we see in the world around us. From the 1950s to the 1960s, particle physics was a new and exciting subject, and many hadrons were discovered. It was a great mystery as to why there were so many different kinds of particles that had no apparent purpose. Some physicists even joked that, phys that physics was turning into botany. This finally brings us to the connection between the math and the physics. In the early 1960s, a physicist named Murray Gell-Mann used group theory to show why the hadron existed, in a theory he called the Eightfold Way. What Murray Gell-Mann discovered and won the Nobel Prize for was that just as a cube has symmetries, so do all hadrons. The kinds of symmetries we deal with in particle physics are more abstract than the ones we are familiar with. They are what I call replacement symmetries. Imagine a long row of identical chairs. If I secretly swapped the positions of two of the chairs, would you be able to notice what I had done? 
you would have no way of knowing whether I had done nothing, swapped two chairs, or even swapped all of the chairs. This is what I mean by a replacement symmetry. In physics, a similar, yet more complex, type of symmetry occurs. If the up, down, and strange quarks were exactly like the chairs, they would be indistinguishable. However, the up quark has a slightly smaller mass than the down quark, and the strange quark has a slightly larger mass than, than the down quark. So, they are not completely symmetric. The quarks do, however, share some of the same properties, such as what they can interact with. So it is said that there is an approximate symmetry between them. This is known as a flavor symmetry. Using the chair analogy, we would only be able to put the chairs in a few specific configurations in order to keep the final arrangement indistinguishable. Remember that groups can have names? The quark symmetry group is called SU3, which is very similar to the symmetry group of three chairs. If we swap two chairs' positions, this transformation would be called an element in the symmetry group. There is an element in the SU3 group that swaps all up quarks for down quarks and vice versa. In doing that, this transformation would also make every neutron a proton and every proton a neutron. If we apply the SU3 transformations to a quark, we are in a way moving it around an abstract three-dimensional space where instead of x, y, and z axes, there are up, down, and strange quark axes. The application of SU3 elements to quarks and hadrons is sometimes called a flavor rotation. Here is a bit of terminology. Hadrons consisting of two quarks are mesons, and hadrons consisting of three quarks are baryons. Murray Gelman found that if we apply SU3 transformations to hadrons, we can change them into different hadrons that have similar properties. These collections of hadrons are called multiplets. Applying the SU3 transformations to a meson yields a total of eight different mesons, which form an eight-dimensional multiplet, or an octet. If we apply this procedure to baryons, like the proton or neutron, we also get an octet. Here is a representation of the meson octet and the baryon octet, where each Greek letter represents a particle. If we apply this procedure to certain other baryons, we get a multiplet of 10 different baryons called a decuplet. When this theory was new, it predicted all the hadrons known at that time, so physicists knew it was consistent with observed reality. But it also predicted one new particle in the baryon decuplet that, that had not been discovered. It was a baryon called the omega minus that consisted of three strange quarks. When it was discovered a few years later, it was considered experimental evidence for the theory and Murray Gelman won the 1969 Nobel Prize in Physics. This breakthrough is important not just because it tells us about the universe. It is also a perfect example of how math and physics are so closely related. Some people think that math is only a tool one uses to understand physics, but one might go so far as to say that physics actually is math. Either way, it is especially apparent in this example that abstract mathematical concepts such as groups, can conjure themselves in the physical world.